Welcome to Macro Musings, where each week we pull back the curtain and take a closer look at the most important macroeconomic issues of the past, present, and future. I am your host, David Beckworth, a senior research fellow at the Mercatus Center at George Mason University, and I'm glad you've decided to join us. Our guest today is Mark Kayoma. Mark is an associate professor of economics at George Mason University and a colleague of mine here at the Mercatus Center. Mark, along with his co-author, Jared Rubin, has written a book titled How the World Became Rich, The Historical Origins of Economic Growth, and he joins us today to discuss it. Mark, welcome back to the show. Thanks for having me, David. Looking forward to it. Well, it's great to have you on, and you do a lot of work on economic history, long-run economic growth, and this is such an important topic. Sometimes on this podcast, we get caught up in business cycle questions, you know, the pandemic, the inflation surge, the recovery, and these are all important questions. But when we pull back the lens and we look at the broader historical perspective, it's even more important, you know, where we go over the next 50, 100 years, right? That makes a difference between people escaping poverty versus those being into it. So it's, it's important to avoid the Great Depression or the Great Recession. But I think it's even more important to think about how do we alleviate poverty and how do we pull people into the good life that we know in many of the advanced economies of the world. And your book is a great way to think about it, to tackle it. And your book provides a great overview of the theories. And so I'm real excited to have you on. In fact, Mark, this is a little overdue because this book came out in 2022. We talked about doing this earlier. So thank you for coming on. And you're going to keep us straight on long-run economic growth and what motivates it. So tell us about the book. How did you guys do this? Why do it? And why now? So we've been uh, teaching, both Jared and myself, have been teaching economic history for roughly a little bit more than 10 years to undergraduates. And there are a lot of classic books about the origins of, of economic growth, books that we reference here, like Jared Diamond's book, uh, Guns, Germs, and Steel. David Landers has a, has a book. Uh, there's a lot of gr- great books, but those books are somewhat old, and they don't reflect this bludgeoning, kind of growing new literature in development and economics and in economic history of the last 20 years. This the literature which has really um, shed new light on the empirical foundations of our understanding of growth, both in you know the countries in Western Europe, which eventually uh, pioneered the Industrial Revolution, but also actually like looking across the world at parts like parts of the world like East Asia or uh, the colonized world. So we thought that there was a real kind of gap in the market for, for surveying that literature and bringing together those insights and packaging in a way that was accessible, you know, both to, you know, undergraduate students, people in adjacent fields, scholars, but also to some degree kind of the reading public. Yeah, and it's a really great read. We'll have a link to the book in our show notes. And before we jump into the various competing theories or maybe even complementary theories for economic growth, and then you have some case studies we'll walk through as well. Just briefly, Mark, I want to get a a survey of of this literature. So you mentioned there's a lot of work being done, currently has been done since some of these, you know, other books have come out that you touched on, Jared Diamond's book, which is one that I I remember reading back in the day as well and was really influential and all my friends had a copy of it. Landis book, that was also a, a fun read as well. What are people doing now in, in this literature? So f- I bring it up because I also remember a period where cross-country growth recessions were really popular, right? Is this literature now doing more and more kind of this applied micro with natural experiments approach? Is that kind of the, the where the cutting edge is? Yeah, that precisely, David. So, um, yeah, if you think about in the 1990s, cross-country growth regressions were were kind of the frontier of research. And they tell you some things. They tell you quite a lot about the correlates of growth. They tell you something about things which give us some sort of stylized facts about, you know, the things which come together. But they're not necessarily well suited for uh, identifying causal effects. And so a, a strand of this literature, particularly in, in development, has definitely been applying uh, applying micro approaches, so kind of different identification strategies, all aimed at identifying kind of causal effects to development, but also to the kind of deep origins of development, so to economic history. So, you know, think about uh, as pioneers of this research, Darren Esamoglu and his co-authors, uh, Simon Johnson and James Robinson, and also uh, Melissa Dell, 
uh, Nathan Nunn. So that's part of where we're going. Like that's 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 a literature many people are familiar with because it's been tremendously influential in, in development as well as in economic history. But there's also you know like careful economic history work, more traditional clear metric historic economic history work which has gone on. So for example. The Angus Madison was a pioneer of historical growth statistics. So a lot of the data we need to estimate kind of growth isn't available before about 1870. So Angus Madison pioneered these estimates for GDP going back further and further in time. But the data he had were quite crude, were quite rough. And more recently, other scholars have gone in and basically updated a lot of these figures, provided figures for countries which just didn't have estimates before. I would say there's both this very, um, very influential applied micro development literature, which we which yeah. we survey and we bring into field. And there's been updates with it amongst more traditional economic history scholarship, which has actually updated how we think about these questions. So there's efforts going on to collect and build up data sets for historical periods throughout the world. There's also kind of the cutting edge natural experiments, uh, quasi natural experiments. Are there any attempts at theory? So I, I, I think in particular of like uh, Paul Romer and his endogenous growth theory. That was really influential too back when I was in grad school. Theory has been less influential, a little bit to the detriment probably of scholarship. We, you know, in the heyday of, of growth econ, we were investigating kind of testing the predictions of say the Roman model and other models of endogenous growth. And the, the current trend in development economics is atheoretical often. So that's the, that both, both in natural experiment work and also the actual experimental development economics of, of Banerjee and Duflo. And I, I would say that's that's reflective of the papers we survey in our book. But I think there's a room for economic theory in, in these historical questions. So Avner Greif, whose work I'm sure you know, he was very influential, again, about 20 or 30 years ago in, in introducing game theoretic models into economic history. And I would say there's definitely a room for this. It's probably under exploited right now, underutilized. I think that there are kind of particularly political economy questions where it's not obvious what the what the prediction should be. Like you maybe you need a model to get some predictions. There, there are a few areas where I think model, models are making a, a bit of a comeback in this area. Boy, I, at least I hope so. I would say in development economics more generally, sometimes you need theory to interpret the mechanisms. So you can you can do like policy evaluation. You, you can identify a, a causal impact of an experiment because you know it's it's very well set up and people understand that like you know it can't be easily manipulated but why are we getting the results we're getting maybe we need some theory so theory has been neglected uh it's not very prominent in, in in our book but actually both me and jared think it should be making a bit of a comeback okay well let's move into your book what it does uh, what it what it aims to do and we'll get back to maybe theory near the end. I, I do want to come back to endogenous growth theory, because one of the questions I think that I think about now is, is the decline in the population growth in the world. What bearing might that have long term? But let's, let's get to your book. And, and let's first start with your first chapter, which I think is very important. And I think it's easy for many of us who listen to the show, who live in advanced economies to take for granted that we live in a very rich world, a world of abundance. You know, it's it's kind of like looking at the curvature of the earth. You can't see it because you're standing right here and it's and you have to really step way back to, to really see the full story. And when you got riches right in front of you, I think it's hard to appreciate this point. So so remind us where we are in Earth's history in terms of human economic growth and, and how long it took us to get here. Yeah, so it's a great point. I mean, we're roughly maybe 20 times richer than our ancestors were in 1800. I think I, I borrowed that estimate from uh, Didger McCloskey. And so there's been a great enrichment, again, to use uh, McCloskey's uh, terminology, a great enrichment, and particularly since 1800, though it began a little bit before. And I think it's important to realize that, so we know that's the case in the United States, uh, Western Europe, uh, parts of East Asia, but it's important to realize that almost all parts of the world are comparatively rich relative to the world before 1800. And so the vast majority of countries are richer today than the United States was in per capita income terms in 1900. So the United States in 1900 was the world, world's richest economy, and the majority of the world's countries have populations whose incomes exceed that today. And so uh, most people now live in middle-income countries. It's largely due to the growth of 
income in, in, in China and India. So, in, so middle income countries are by no means rich in a contemporary, by contemporary standards. And we, we would like these, these countries to be much wealthier than they are, but they're rich by historical standards. So in middle income countries, the vast majority of the population are not in any danger of starvation. They have adequate nutrition. They have adequate resources to meet their everyday needs. So in historical terms, like relative to human beings as a species, most people today are rich. And to highlight the points you make in your book, we had both the, the takeoff with the Industrial Revolution several hundred years ago, but even more recently, we've had parts of the world like Asia really explode. I mean, people talk about China lifting a billion people out of poverty, or the growth in, in Asia lifting a billion people out of poverty. So it's it's a real success story, and you provide a number of measures in that first chapter to, to remind us where we are, and, and the fact is we need to explain this, how we got here. Um, one of the, the metrics that you use that I really like is you know, what percent of the population is living in extreme poverty. I think if you go back to 1800s, you have 90%. Now it's below 10%. Um, you do the typical you know, per capita GDP. You look at life expectancy, a number of measures. And you, you ask this one hypothetical question. I just want to park here for a minute because you give a, an example later in the book. But in that first chapter, you ask this question. Would you trade your current life for the life of, of wealth of an English baron in, say, 1200? Now, I want to go to chapter 5, and this isn't even 1200. This is 1700. But let me read the, the first few uh, sentences from the chapter 5. It's on fewer babies. And you and your co-author write, It is January 24th, 1700. A cold winter air blows through Westminster Abbey in the center of London. Even open fires and cold braziers struggle against the winter chill. Princess Anne, heir to the throne of England, is silently sobbing into her bedclothes, surrounded by her maids and ladies-in-waiting. Anne had miscarried again. Though only 33, this was her 17th and last pregnancy. She had not produced a living heir. Of her four last births, only one outlived early childhood. But Prince William died at age 11 of pneumonia, having been bled and blistered by his doctors. And then you go on to talk about Anne's own frail health. But that is such a powerful illustration of what it was like back then. And she was, you know, the heir to the throne. She had all the best medicine, resources, food. And yet her life was very precarious. She couldn't bring a child to adulthood. So maybe shed some more light on that, that, that point. Why wouldn't we want to be a baron back in 1200 or switch, swap places, even if it seems appealing on the surface? You have command over people. So if you, as a baron in 1200 or Queen Anne uh, in the early 18th century, you have a lot of power over other human beings. But your power to affect your environment is actually still limited because of the technology is, is, is basic. So, so you have a lot of resources and you can command armies and have many servants. But your ability to, you know, heat your house adequately or have air conditioning or translate your income into, say, medical technologies is limited because of the baseline technologies available to those societies are limited. I think that's how we think about it. And so all those riches, they buy you status, they buy you something which we value, but they, they're quite feeble when translated into means of appro- improving one's um, material uh, condition. So what we've had as a result of modern economic growth, is just much more efficient translation of resources into things which materially affect how we live. So an, another example is, like, if you wanted an ice cream in 18th century England, you could have it, especially in winter. In summer, you could still have it if you're rich enough, but you have to be rich enough to basically get a block of ice and, like, you know, have mass quantities of ice taken from some cold mountainous region, taken to where you are, and then some of your servants can maybe make some ice cream. But today, basically... Anybody in the Western world, or even not the Western world, anywhere, anybody in most parts of the world can, for basically a dollar or two dollars, have a you know, huge array of different ice creams. Okay, so we live in an amazing time and place in terms of economic history. And again, it's, it's easy to forget just a few hundred years ago, almost everyone was poor. And, and the rich were really, truly, you know, the rulers, the, the, the few elites who had access to it. And so this is a complete you know, reversal of, of fortunes for most of humanity. All right, so we're going to go through some of your chapters here and just a brief outline of what we're going to do. So in your book, you go through the theories of why the world became rich. And the first one is geography. Second one is institutions. Third theory is culture. 
demographics, and then maybe colonization and exploitation. So let's start with geography. And you already mentioned Jared Diamond's famous book, Guns, Germans, Steel, where he makes a strong case for demographics. Uh, But walk us through the arguments made for geography and why that really drives long-run economic growth. Yeah, so geography is a powerful kind of constraint on the economic activities we we can we can do. And Jared Diamond kind of gives one example of this when he's um gives a powerful explanation for why uh, the Spanish, but it could have been anybody from Europe or anyone from Asia, why the Spanish was so uh, had so many advantages over the Incas in the early 16th century. And so Diamond's geographical argument really is about the location of certain crops. So crops, it's very difficult to domesticate crops. Only a small proportion of crops are likely to be ever ever to be capable of being domesticated by humans. Similarly, animals, there are only a small number of large mammals who have ever been domesticated. And so if you think about some kind of geographical lottery, which determines where these cultivatable crops or animals happen to be, some parts of the world happen to be more fortuitous than others. So the Middle East, the so-called Fertile Crescent, happens to be a place which had a lot of these preconditions for agriculture. So they get agriculture earlier than other parts of the world. And then because of uh, the shape of the Eurasian landmass, these early agricultural technologies spread basically relatively quickly across uh, Eurasia so that people in China have um, rice agriculture and they have um, other technologies as well as the people in Europe. But in the Americas, they don't have wheat, they don't have barley or oats, they only have maize. And maize is harder to produce it spreads much more slowly. They also don't have metallurgy, and they don't, they don't have very many large domesticated animals. And so in some sense, they're just disadvantaged from the get-go because of their geography. And these effects kind of accumulate over time. So there's some kind of path dependence whereby this early advantage to Eurasia sets in motion many other developments, which then cascade such that uh, the Eurasians have these advantages uh, over the American uh, populations. And that's just one example. Uh, there are others which we discuss in the book, like being landlocked. So Jeffrey Sachs talks about this. And also, your ge- your geographical location affects the disease burden you have. So parts of the world which have have high disease burden, they're malarial, or they're vulnerable to things like the tsetse fly, they might also be historically underdeveloped. Yeah, the Eurasia example you gave was very interesting. So it's easy to think about, yeah, okay, they they had a head start, but it was also this compounding effect that you noted, the interaction. They were exposed to animals, to, to horses, to cattle early on, and therefore they were exposed to the diseases that these animals carried where in North America they were not. So when they come over, they carry all these diseases. And, and so they have this head start, both immunity, but also tools, technology, and it's a really interesting argument, and you mentioned that, the landlocked, as you mentioned, versus coast, mountain ranges, climate, disease burden. I was also intrigued to read in your book, and, and this is good for me to get my, my literature up to speed on, on where things stand, but the Robert Fogel had a famous book he wrote, I think it won a Nobel Prize, right? The one on, on the railroads. So he argued that the railroads really weren't that consequential to the development of the U.S. economy. And his argument is, well, if there hadn't been railroads, canals and other forms of transportation would have stepped in. Kind of do the right counterfactual is his point. A very clever approach. But apparently there's been recent research that, that kind of you know puts down that idea, or at least weakens that idea, because there's other indirect effects that it, it contributed. Maybe speak to that that finding. Yeah, so it's a um, so Fogel's um, argument was undoubtedly groundbreaking. So as you say, it's like the idea that there's a there's a counterfactual. So Fogel's key kind of insight is there's some substitutability. So historians would say like the railroads made America, the railroads made it possible to kind of domesticate this in, this incredibly large landmass. And Fogel's point is actually you know like the, the, the railroad effect isn't just the, what you see. It's the it's a relative effect relative to the next best transportation technology, which are, say, canals, and so Erie Canal or, or other waterways, which also can, can integrate an economy. But the, the particular approach he uses relies on just the standard assumptions of, of kind of benchmark kind of neoclassical economics, uh, particularly with assumption of, 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 of kind of perfect competition. And uh, the more recent work by Donaldson and Hornbeck, what they're doing is they're taking into account, as you say, these indirect effects, but particularly a market size effect. If you were close to a canal, then obviously the marginal effect of the railroad is small. 
But if you're in a part of America which which wasn't likely to be connected by a canal and you happen to get a railroad, what's the net effect of a railroad on your economy? And they say you have to take into account that basically without this transportation technology, these places would be very isolated from other markets. And so the local firm would be a monopoly. Their ability to diversify and specialize uh, would be limited. So I interpret it at least very much as a Adam Smithian point. And Adam Smith kind of insight, the benefit of the transportation technology is mediated through the size of the market. And so the railroad does have a big impact when you take into account its effect on the overall size of the market. So we have all these arguments for why geography matters. And we have some prominent economists who've made the case, Jared Diamond, Jeffrey Sachs, and others. But there's a limit to this argument, as you note in your, your book, right? You make the point that geography may be a constraint and it may affect where you go, but it's fixed. So, so why does that fixed matter? Why does that make this argument not as thorough and, and conclusive as some think it is? There are two, two reasons. One is um, it can't explain any reversal in fortune, or it struggles on its own at least to explain any reversal in fortune. So if some areas are kind of blessed by good geography, they should be rich in ancient times and in modern times. And at some level, this this is we do observe this. So if you think about city locations, might might be constant through time, which parts of the country are, are relative, you know, have cities, that location might be good in the Middle Ages, might be good today. But we know, at least um, in some countries, we know there have been reversals of fortune. So areas which, which have been ahead, which have fallen behind, and areas which were backwaters, which have then overtaken them. And so geography on its own kind of struggles to, to explain this. That's a reversal of fortune. The other um, issue is the timing. So what we see is, uh, you know, with the Industrial Revolution is a dramatic, at least in historical timescales, a dramatic increase in the rate of economic growth after roughly 1750 or 1800. And so geography doesn't give you much of a hold or but there's not much traction geography into explaining why the overall rate of growth across several societies at once picks up after around 1750. Okay, so it can explain reversal. So the example you give in the book is, you know, in around 1000, the Middle East was far ahead of Europe economically, but now it's reversed. And then the growth change. So the, the geography is constant, but growth is accelerated. You need a variable that kind of changes with the growth rate to Fully explain the story. Okay, so that's geography. Let's move on to your next chapter on institutions. First, define what institutions are and what you mean in this case. Yeah, so we're drawing on uh, this kind of economic definition of institutions, which is more abstract probably than the everyday definition. It's not just a, an organization like the Federal Reserve. An institution, in the language of uh, Douglas North, a Nobel Prize winning economic historian, is a, is a set of rules, the rules of a game. And the idea is these rules of a game matter because they structure the incentive systems we face. So North's famous insight was that uh, things like investment People might say, what drives economic growth? And you'd say investment in capital or capital accumulation. And North's point was that if that's true, that is a cause of growth, but it's a it's only approximate cause. There's something which is shaping your incentive to invest as opposed to not invest that money. And so that incentive structure, he then calls institutions and then argues that's the core driver of, of growth. And you cite AC Moglu and Robinson. They have a, an interesting categorization of institutions. They talk about inclusive versus extractive growth institutions. So maybe maybe highlight the historical context in which they're applying that and what it means. Yeah, so that's particularly in their 2012 book, Why Nations Fail, they're really thinking about what kind of institutions are impediment to growth, uh, particularly they're thinking about institutions imposed, say, by the Spanish Empire on its colonies, or institutions we might observe today in kind of kleptocratic, dictatorial regimes like North Korea or Syria. And they're contrasting those with types of institutions we as economists genuinely think of as being good for economic growth. So a stable system of property rights, uh, a market economy. And they particularly distinguish between economic institutions and political institutions, but they argue there's a key feedback relationship between them. And so a set of extractive political institutions are compatible with a set of extractive economic institutions, but they're unlikely to support inclusive economic institutions or inclusive political institutions. So the idea being that a market society, a free market, 
will generate a lot of entrance and it'll generate a lot of kind of um, uh, churn amongst the rich. And that will undermine a, a kleptocratic or highly autocratic regime. Okay. Let's flush that out a little bit more. So you give the example of Spain, and you touched on this already, versus, say, the United Kingdom, Great Britain, or the Netherlands. So Spain had the monarchy, and the monarchy controlled everything, all of its colonies, and it was definitely after extraction, so this extractive emphasis. And, and their argument is this led to a set of institutions, political and economic over there, in many of the, its, its Latin American colonies that were, were not conducive to long-run growth, whereas Great Britain had a different approach to the its colonies, and in part because it had parliament, had checks on the monarch's power. Discuss that example of how these institutions can interact, so from the top down to the structures of the economy, how the political and economic institutions kind of feed off each other and have long-lasting effects. Yeah, so it's a little bit like a resource curse argument, the argument for for Spain versus England. So this, the Spanish crown is already, uh, it has a, there is a parliament in Spain in 1500, but the, the way colonization takes place is it's basically done under the auspices of the crown, and the crown get a big cut of the riches, basically the conquistadors acquire when they conquer uh, native peoples in the Americas. And they get access particularly first to gold, but then later to silver. So there's a big silver mine in Peru. And so some of Johnson Robinson's argument is that this windfall basically enriches the crown and it allows the crown to cement its control over indigenous local, the, the local Spanish parliaments and basically make the Spanish monarchy more authoritarian and autocratic. So it's an institutional resource curse. So Spain basically gets the, the, the you know, quote unquote best colonies. In, in the Americas, but over time it worsens the Spanish institutions and like actually makes Spain poorer in the long run. In contrast, the argument about English colonization is the English are latecomers, they get uh, Virginia basically and New England, and these are not desirable territories because they're they're very underpopulated. Virginia is just forest, there's no silver, there's no gold, the native population is very sparse, so they're not many slaves. And so the consequences of this for England is that the, the, the Atlantic economy, which does grow up, when it grows up, is largely in private hands. So it's largely private merchants. And these private merchants basically empower uh, the parliamentary side of things in the conflicts between the crown and parliament. And they then push for kind of more representative government, more checks and balances, more constraints on the executive, and more kind of support for property rights and markets. And that explains some of the differences today between, say, North America and South America. No, it does two jobs. Yeah, I should I should be clear. It's both explaining the differences between North America and South America, and that's what Johnson's Robertson's argument. And it's explaining the small divergence within Europe. Why after fifteen hundred, Spain does less well than England. Okay, so it affects institutions both at home in the European countries as well as in the uh, economies. You gave an example in your book of finding that found that institutions and geography can interact with each other. You showed that parts of Africa that had great coastlines, easy access, tended to be raided more often, and that affected their long-term institutions and, and, and the way that they they function economically versus places that weren't very accessible I thought that was a, a neat illustration of how these these different effects can interact with each other. Yeah, that's uh, based on Nathan Nunn's research. So it's another example of an yeah, institution and geography interacting, uh, which is a key theme. So slavery is very detrimental for long-run development in Africa. It undermines trust and state building. It's a, a key kind of conclusion from Nathan Nunn's work. And what he shows is basically ruggedness to some degree affects the likelihood of native populations being uh, enslaved. It's easier to escape could be slave traders and slave capturers in the mountains, in the highlands. In, in the rest of the world, ruggedness is bad for economic development, but in Africa, it's, it's positively correlated to economic development. Yeah, very interesting. And so the key question out of that, that chapter of institutions is, well, how do we get good institutions? We touched on some of it. There's some path dependency, some interaction with other factors. But that's kind of the question. We, we have geography, we have institutions, how do we get good institutions? So let's move on to something closely related to it, culture. Why does culture affect economic outcomes? And, and first, let's start with the definition. What do you mean by culture in this discussion? 
Yeah, so the definition of culture we kind of emphasize and draw on is drawing on um, the work of um, Harvard anthropologist Joseph Heinrich. So it's the idea that as humans, we, we kind of have a lot of shortcuts and heuristics that we use in our head to make decisions. And so uh, a key one which we'll discuss and we discuss is, uh, is trust, right? So should I trust a stranger or not? And so some of that is a ra rational calculation, but some of it is, is just like something in my brain kind of prompts me to do something. And that's kind of what we mean by culture. So culture of trust or culture of distrust, but the culture can apply to a culture of, of, of savings or thriftiness versus a culture of, of expenditure. So culture just refers to any one of these sets of, of traits which shape how we reason and shape our preferences. So going back to the story of Africa and slavery, you, you talk about in your book how those places that were uh, raided often for slavery, often the, the trust became very low in the remaining populations. They didn't trust their, their leaders, and, and that continues to this day. So again, another, I think, powerful illustration of how these geography, institutions, culture can interact with each other. So it's not easy to draw a clean, you know, monocausal story. It was just this factor, not the other ones. All right. One of the fascinating areas of culture, of course, is religion. And, and so, you know, we have to ask, does religion matter? Uh, so very much so, but not necessarily in a way that people have always uh, thought. So I guess a key example is the Protestant uh, work ethics and Max Weber's hypothesis that the, there's something about uh, Protestants which make them either save more or work harder, and that drives it's, that's a key driver of differences in economic outcomes between Protestants and Catholics. So that that's a, like a, a long-standing hypothesis in the social sciences, which was originally formulated by by Weber. And when Weber formulated it, it did make sense in the sense that many of the richest countries in the world, like um, Great Britain or North America, were predominantly Protestant at that time, and the UK was much richer than, say, Spain in 1900. Similarly, within Germany. In 1900, uh, the northern, more Protestant areas were richer than the southern, more Catholic areas like Bavaria. But it turns out that today, this doesn't really hold nearly as strongly. So, you know, Italy and Spain are not meaningfully much poorer than, say, the United Kingdom. Within a country, say, Bavaria is, is, is a richer part of Germany than, than the northern parts. So, so this, this correlation is, has substantially weakened. And uh, the research we kind of document in our book by uh, Sasha Becker and Ludwig Wissmann argues that the real channel for this association, this correlation between Protestantism and higher growth in the 19th century and early 20th century wasn't a work ethic or savings, but it was due to education and human capital. So uh, something that can be documented is that Protestants were more literate than Catholics after the Reformation. So Protestantism had an effect. It, it caused higher literacy across Northern Europe. And higher literacy didn't really matter for growth that much in the pre-industrial period, because if you're a literate farmer or an illiterate farmer, it doesn't make a huge amount of difference. But by 1900, it does make a difference. Like workers who could read or write, they can operate machinery, they can follow instructions. They're just, it's, just, it's just positively associated with productivity. And so the, the Protestant areas have benefit from having a more educated workforce and that's largely a result of, of, of Protestantism, at least according to this, this paper by Becker and Wissmann. So to the extent it had an effect, it's because it, it, it drove literacy, kind of going off the Protestant call for sola scriptura, you know, read the Bible only, and that required literacy. The, the other thing about that that's interesting is the long-lasting influence that we do see with culture. All right, let's move on to demographics in the next chapter, and this is where you bring up Thomas Malthus and Malthusian theory, and, and you tie it into the Black Death and the big debate over real wages. So the effect of the Black Death on real wages. The Malthusian framework is a, is a very useful, kind of simple framework for thinking about uh, the pre-industrial world. So in the pre-industrial world, agriculture is the main, main source of, of economic development, and it's subject to diminishing returns to labor. And so most people are farmers. And so if you add more people, basically, you think about adding one extra worker to a fixed plot of land, that worker's marginal product will be lower, so his wage will be lower, and, and his living standards will be lower. So this is this Malthusian insight that adding more people doesn't, doesn't grow the economy. It, it makes people worse off. And so in this context, the Black Death is this tremendous shock which kills 
a third to a half of the population. And so this 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 question about what impact it has on on the economy, both real wages, but also per capita GDP. And so I'll tell you kind of what actually happens in terms of like people often think of it as happening immediately. But initially, actually, the Black Death is such a devastating shock that actually it causes a lot of economic hardship because it kills so many people that there are not enough workers to harvest the, the, the grain. So fields are lying empty because there, there's just a scarcity of workers and there's just so much disruption. And it's a, it's, so it's actually associated with a lot, of, a lot of inflation initially. So real wages don't go up right away. Uh, similarly, this is an economy bound by custom. It's not an economy used to dealing with nominal price increases. So it takes some time. But within like a decade, the workers are demanding higher and higher nominal wages. And the lords are, are saying this is outrageous. These pesky peasants are asking for wages twice what they were, uh, you know, 10 years ago. This, is, this, is, this can't happen. And they try to legislate against it. But, you know, the market eventually speaks, labor scarcity eventually speaks. And so workers are able to, to increase their, their demands and, and, and inflation kind of stabilizes. So real wages do go up eventually. This is helped by uh, the plague returning periodically. So the plague keeps coming back, keeping the population down. And so real wages peak in England around 1450. So the century after the Black Death, population has gone down to, to being under 2 million, so probably a third of what it was a century before, and workers are, are really getting a lot in, in terms of real wages, part of which they're consuming in the form of, of, of actual wages, but part of this they're consuming in the form of, of more leisure time. So they just work less as well. That's partly how they're consuming this. They're also consuming this in the form of a more protein, meat-based diet. They're drinking more beer. Uh, peasants in 1300 probably weren't eating much meat, but 1450 they are. So, so, so they do benefit from this labor scarcity, but not in a way that leads to modern economic growth because these are still agrarian economies. They haven't really industrialized in any meaningful sense. So Thomas Malthus and his theory, it, it actually it makes sense up until the Industrial Revolution, right? He, Malthus all, today kind of gets a bad name, right? People kind of make fun of Malthusian economics and stuff. But I think what, what I'm hearing here is that this actually makes great sense up until the Industrial Revolution. Yeah, exactly. So, so Malthus is, is correct about his world until the point in which he's writing. So he's just as he starts writing, he's precisely going to be incorrect. But um, he's very accurate in describing the world he's been living through, which is what you'd expect a man is really smart. And he's looking at like, you know, a lot of history. He's surveying history. He doesn't have, you know, what we would consider like hard data, but he has a lot of data points. And he's he's correctly kind of fitting a theory which which matches all of those data points. The work of Ode Galore is is very much we were discussing kind of theories before. He provides a theoretical framework which actually links this Malthusian model with a modern growth regime, it, it kind of unifies the two. That's one, one which provides us one way of thinking about you know, why was the world Malthusian before and why did it cease to be Malthusian in, in the long run after 1800. So when did he write his famous work? I see he was born in 1766. He dies in 1834. I think the first edition is 1797, but he keeps updating it. I think the first edition is 1797. And he, that's the the first edition is the one which is kind of most famous. That's where he kind of predicts doom and gloom. Okay. And his later editions, he moderates a little bit. Well, that's interesting. He writes at that time because Adam Smith is also writing about that time. And he, Adam Smith actually gets it right. I mean, Adam Smith, he, he sees modern economic growth, markets and stuff. But Thomas Malthus' problem was he's looking back, I guess, too much and maybe not appreciating the market process. Yeah, I would just caveat that to say that I think Smith scholars are just undecided about how optimistic he is in the long run. I think that's okay. like, you know, like if there's an there's an optimistic reading in there. There's also quotes where he talks about a stationary state. So, so Smith scholars are in two minds. I I like to think he's optimistic as well because he he envisions increasing returns. Okay, so I, I like to think of him as optimistic. Malthus thought he was building on Smith. Okay, interesting. Yeah, he doesn't think he's refuting Smith. He thinks Smith would agree with him. Well, that's interesting. So some Smithian scholars think that Adam Smith wasn't that optimistic long-run growth, and, and Thomas Malthus thought he was building upon it. And you got Karl Marx writing to sometime around that period. So a lot of, lot of ways to interpret as very you know pessimistic outlooks during this time. But yeah, I will claim Adam Smith in the uh, camp for long-run optimism. 
And and the I guess the argument there again to summarize is that the the Black Death the reoccurrence of it kind of of the plague in some sense, facilitated economic growth, although this isn't a great story when we get to the Industrial Revolution. The last chapter on potential explanations is the one on colonization, exploitation, and we've kind of touched on some of this already, the slave trade, the European powers taking advantage of their head start. What can we say about this particular explanation? So, so European colonization is obviously a huge, huge topic. As an explanation for modern economic growth, on its own, I don't think it flies. So there's a there's a naive version of this, whereby you know, the riches of England uh, after the Industrial Revolution are due to the pillaging India, and so the, people think of this as very, as very much a transfer of resources from one part of the world to the other. It's very much a zero sum way of thinking, and that obviously is ludicrous once you see the scale of the growth. Colonization is largely a consequence of economic growth and industrialization, not a cause. There are some scholars who see like some role for colonization as an input to growth. So there's some some arguments that the sugar sugar slavery nexus in the, in the Caribbean in Britain was was important in facilitating industrialization. So so colonization could have played a role, but it's going to be um, subsumed or interacting with all these other factors making Britain an industrial hub after 1800, not the sole or main cause of it. Okay, so those are the main theories that you outline in your book. And then in the rest of the book, we get into, you know, where we are today, and also the case study of Great Britain and the Industrial Revolution, why it took off. And so maybe let's, 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 let's go there. Let's talk about the UK. Why was the UK the place that the Industrial Revolution started? You note that the the Netherlands, the Dutch, they also had great opportunities as well. They, they had a, a robust economy. They had ships. Why was it the UK, Great Britain, is the place where the Industrial Revolution started? So I think it's not a single one factor. That's kind of the, the way we, we picture it in, in, our, in that chapter. So it's a confluence of factors. So one difference between the Dutch and the British is size of the economy. So the Dutch are prosperous. They're, they're mercantile. They're, you know, if we want to use that word, they're capitalists, right? Yeah. And so their per capita income is, is high in 1700. They're disadvantaged by geopolitics. So the Dutch are invaded by the French in the late 17th century. They, they fight them off successfully, but they incur huge, a huge national debt. This is actually um, more up your alley, David, because it's a macro thing. They incur, they incur a huge debt, which they have to pay off in the 18th century. And they actually raise very high taxes, very, they're, they're the most taxed country in Europe to pay back this debt. And so, from a political economy perspective, uh, you could say the Dutch are just too small, and the British are Britain is big enough. It's got a, and that's both big enough to provide the defence, particularly the Royal Navy, to fend off the French, but not without burdening the domestic economy with too big a fiscal state. Uh, contemporaries like David Hume and Adam Smith did think taxes were too high, and debt was too high in England in the 18th century. They complained about this a lot, but. In, in, in you know, ex post, it doesn't seem to have been too high because the Industrial Revolution was still able to get going, even though the British state was taxing a lot and, and using it to, to fund the Royal Navy. Another reason in which size helps the British relative to the Dutch is the internal market. So Britain has is, is got enough consumers, its population is growing in the 18th century. And so if, you, if you're a Smithian, there's, there's a scope for the division of labor in Britain. And going back to the stuff we discussed in our geography chapter, uh, the British also really build a lot of infrastructure, a lot of new roads and canals, which help knit together this kind of growing commercial economy. Then there are some other background factors, which should, some of which are common to the Netherlands and also to Britain. So one background factor was the scientific revolution. So the scientific revolution was putting, you know, laying a groundwork of ideas uh, really establishing the idea that um, we could use science to improve nature. So we could use science to to improve the productivity of, of nature, uh, better fertilizers, the soil, using machines to improve worker productivity. And as, as we'll get to, the key industry Britain's going to excel in is the textiles industry. And so there, the British already have, like, um, they've been doing textiles since the Middle Ages, so they already have some kind of preconditions to really develop this textile as a, as a key industry of industrial revolution. Whereas the, the Dutch don't so much. They have some textiles, but not as much as actually what was in Belgium or the, uh, the low countries, what would become Belgium. That was more of a center for, for um, the textiles. 
And so the Dutch are, are really ahead of ahead on commerce and trade, but they're not as well positioned for manufacturing. Okay. So that's the story. And, and there's the, an entire chapter in the book that listeners can go check out. So it makes a lot of sense. I, I want to go back, though, Mark, to the conversation you had back when you were first on the show. And, and that's Rome. <laughs> okay. So we, as we talked about back then, Rome had about a million people at its peak. Is that right? The population? Is that correct? Okay. And they were able to, 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 you know, to feed them, to, to, to thrive for some time. And that, that suggests a big market. I think there's evidence that there was, you know, a, a, the Smithian kind of market process. So why couldn't Rome have reached something like this? Why couldn't Rome have, have kept growing, even if it wasn't quite, didn't have all the ingredients, but over time accumulate the necessary ingredients to put it at the place where Great Britain was on the eve of the Industrial Revolution? Yeah, it's a great question. Um, I've just been reading a book called Pox Romana, which actually touches on on these topics as well. So we have a city of Rome has a million people. The Roman Empire itself, maybe maybe fifty to sixty million at its height. And so, um, not ludicrous to think that Rome could have industrialized because London in eighteen hundred is about a million people. And so, a million people means uh, in a city like Rome in 100 CE, you know, it, it means those people are not farmers, right? They're yeah. not living on the land. They're not subsistence agriculturalists. And so they're being supported by someone else. So it speaks to at least a dense trade network. It speaks to like a relatively sophisticated market economy with a division of labor. And the Romans were technologically innovative in a few areas. So concrete, aqueducts, they had some understanding of steam technology even. So there's this big puzzle about why why they don't industrialize. And I, I read a blog post about this several years ago where we speculated slavery is often cited as a reason why they don't invest in labor-saving technologies. And this touches upon uh, what we discuss in the book because one of the prominent arguments for British industrialization is this uh, need for labor-saving technology. So that's Bob Allen's argument that in England, the, the labor costs were, relatively speaking, quite high relative to the costs of, of energy or uh, the cost of capital in the form of interest rates. And so there's a particular incentive to do labor-saving technology, uh, technological changes. And that just wasn't the case in, in, in Rome. I would say, having read more, more widely since then, I'm probably a little bit more pessimistic about the Romans than I was even back then, because a lot of Rome's size was probably due to kind of rents, the political rents being directed into the capital. There's a basically a free grain doll where citizens get free bread and oil. And there's all the wealth of the empire, and there's all the slaves being transported there. So in some sense, Rome is artificially big. It's a it's a huge metropolis, but it's not a it's, that's not a reflection of underlying kind of preferences and productivities in the same way that you know I think London was okay. in 1800. It's partly a reflection of coercion. And so Rome is a market economy, and it's you know in some sense some directions technologically sophisticated, but it's far from being innovative in the way that I think the British economy was after 1700. So it wasn't sustainable. I mean, bottom line, that, that, that the system that it had set up. Yeah, it seems not. It seems not. And then the Roman economy gets a bunch of bad shocks after uh, 150 CE. So the book I read was called The Crocs Roman. It's about the yeah, Antony Plague, the plague of uh, a disease epidemic which which took place in the reign of Marcus Aurelius, which was like we don't know what it was, but it was devastating. And also the work of Kyle Harper shows the Roman Golden Age was a period where the climate was quite favorable to kind of agriculture in North Africa and, and Italy. And after around two fifty or two hundred it gets worse. The climate deteriorates and it becomes drier and less uh, certain. And that's like a negative supply shock. And that seems to also derail the Roman economy. I would say one final point I would just make uh, before concluding on this is that uh, one of the things we argue matters for Europe is, um, is that it's politically fragmented. So political fragment fragmentation means that if one state or policymaker does some bad decision. In some sense, other states don't have to go along with it, and they're somewhat insulated. So Europe is culturally and intellectually quite unified. So ideas cross European borders very, very quickly. Uh, bad policies can, 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 you know, might be confined to one or two states. Not everyone has to do a bad policy if one, one guy does it. And so that's another argument for why Europe is well poised for industrialization after 1700, whereas other parts of the world aren't. And that, that would also apply to why Rome wasn't 
in, in the second century AD. So the Great Britain had a perfect storm of all these pieces coming together that led to the Industrial Revolution. All right, let's go from the Roman Empire to the present day. And there's a lot more in the book, so I encourage listeners to check it out. And again, we'll have a link to it in the show notes. But let's go to the present day. Now, I'll bring up two issues um, related to prospects for future growth going forward. And, and so one I alluded to earlier, and that is population. So it looks like population growth rates are definitely declining. In some places like China, it's absolute decline in population. And if we go to you know, someone like uh, Romer, the endogenous growth theory, what drives growth is this idea generation. I mean, even in the solo model, that, that residual, the total factor productivity, you can think of idea generation being important and you need to have people. You need to have, there's a distribution of, of, of IQs. You just need a lot of people to generate ideas to have sustainable long-run growth. So I guess the question number one would be, you know, should we worry about the decline in population growth? Uh, number two, a more optimistic story would be, AI, you know, AI might be a positive productivity shock, might make up for the decline in population. Um, so do you have any thoughts on those two potential factors that weigh on future economic growth? Yeah, the Roman model, and I said this idea goes back to Michael Kramer, that basically, you know, in a population of a million, you might not get that many geniuses, but in a population of 100 million, you know, the chances are you'll get some. So like, what matters for growth isn't the average, it's the, the tails, because the tails will generate technologies which are then non-rival. And so everyone benefits. So Isaac Newton invents calculus or, uh, um, along with Leibniz, but then everybody thereafter can benefit, even if you know me and you are not nearly as smart as Isaac Newton, but we could benefit from, from the invention of calculus. And so that's one reason why you want population growth. Yeah, the, I, think, so I think it is an issue. The unified growth theories that I mentioned earlier actually endogenize demography. And so they endogenize the idea that once you get to uh, a certain level of income, and uh, population growth will slow down, but it shouldn't decline unless the cost of having children are too high. And so I think that's the the, policy, the problem in, in, in modern countries, developed countries, and it's the worst is in places like South Korea and China, is that the cost of education are too high when you take into account, you know, not just universities, but like extra tutoring uh, and so on. And then the cost of, of having kids in terms of space. So if, if your housing policies are screwed up, that you can't have a, a, a comfortable suburban home, then you're, lo- you're less likely to have children. Another issue is that the, the education structure and the kind of a job structure for women is encourages women to kind of get their careers together uh, first, basically. And so then basically, you know, if you're taking 10 or 15 years after university to establish yourself in your career, that before you start having children, by the time you have children, your, your fertility is, your natural fertility is reduced. And so you may not even be able to have children, even if you want them. So that, those are the fertility issues we face. And I, I think it is an issue. I think it's not fully compensated for by immigration. So some people will say it doesn't matter that the you know the, the Germans or the Italians are not reproducing themselves. They can just immigrate people from the developing world. They think that's the same because they're not one for one substitutes, and there are other costs involved with, with assimilating the immigrants. So it, it's clearly a problem. That's going to be a negative productivity shock potentially. Although actually, it's for first and foremost, it's a it's a problem for entitlements. More before it becomes a problem for innovation, it's a entitlement problem. AI is a positive productivity shock. We don't know how positive we haven't yet seen it really i think in the growth stats and so yeah so that that could offset the negative one we get from a smaller population but i i i don't know i'm not i mean people have switched from being techno pessimists a few years ago to being techno optimists in the last couple of years i i I kind of i i can see why it could be a, a game changer but so far all of the claims I've seen made are a little bit over-exaggerated so far. So people claim it could really improve your research productivity. You can get it to write your code. Uh, maybe those people are just better at using it than I am. <laughs> well, maybe if we get to the place where AI really can make a difference in productivity, we will have a different danger to f- to face if it becomes aware, <laughs> cognizant, and we have, to, we have to deal with another issue. But just circling back to the population growth, this is an issue that near and dear to my heart because I, I see all these issues that we're dealing with today, you know, things like climate change. And you hear people call for having fewer children. And to me, that's completely the opposite solution. The solution should be let's have, you know, 
children and let's let's train them well. And one day, one of them might be an Einstein of climate policy. <laughs> they might or it, climate technology. They might find a solution. You know, that's what we want minds to solve the problem. And as your colleague Alex Tabarek says, do you view a person as a stomach or as a brain? And I think that has a huge bearing on how you view these issues. Yeah, uh, it's Jeannie and Simon, basically. And uh, yeah, I agree. Yeah, Julian Simon, great, great person. Okay, with that, our time is up. Our guest today has been Mark Kayoma. Mark, thanks so much for coming on the show. Mark's book is titled How the World Became Rich, The Historical Origins of Economic Growth. Thanks, David. It's been, uh, it's been great. Macro Musings is produced by the Mercatus Center at George Mason University. Dive deeper into our research at mercatus.org forward slash monetary policy. You can subscribe to the show on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, or your favorite podcast app. If you like this podcast, please consider giving us a rating and leaving a review. This helps other thoughtful people like you find the show. Find me on Twitter at David Beckworth and follow the show at macro underscore musings. <laughs>